Okay, the children are finally dismissed. Bye. If you brought your Bibles, please open us your first letter to St. Paul to Timothy. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 3. And Paul says to Timothy, As I urge you Just about my the purpose for Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Are we to be interested in strange doctrines for doctrines sake? No. All that leads to is confusion. Verse 4. Your to pay attention to Ms. And endless genealogies which rise give, give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Now, let's just pause for a second here. We are not supposed to be smitten by new revelations or obscure facts about the Bible or that give rise to speculations. I mean, I've seen some churches where they focus on prophecy and they have one prophecy after another. A great knowledge, and we're supposed to be so... That is not what impresses God. Come say what impresses God. We'll find out in verse 5. It says, it, but the goal of our instruction is what? Knowledge? No, the goal of our instruction is not knowledge. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. And you say, are you against studying the scriptures? Absolutely not. But the point of studying the scriptures is not so you can be smarter. Oh. So you can be more loving. Yeah. I knew you were going to like this. I'm just telling you. Isn't that the truth? That the goal of our instruction is love. Uh, we need to be wary of anybody claiming a deep, new, heavy revy. You know, I have been around a long time, and fads come through the body of Christ, and people get all excited about them. You know what? They asked D.L. Moody on his death boot. Everybody really know who Dwight L. Moody was, one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived, about 1850, 1860. He saw enormous revival in the United States of America. His converts stuck, and they said, Brother Moody, what's the deepest revelation you ever got from God on his deathbed? And he said, Jesus loves me. This I know. And he said, you came to church tonight to tell you God, yeah. Jeremy didn't know what we were going to be talking about when he chose the songs, but those songs were all about the love of God. The biggest thing that you can ever find out is that God loves you and that you can afford to love people. Everybody say, I can afford to love people. The goal of studying scriptures isn't greater knowledge, but that you'd be able to walk tomorrow in greater love, knowing that you are loved and knowing that love never fails. Now, before you say, oh, we've heard this. I don't care if you've heard it a thousand times. Not one of us is living on the level of love that we could be living to. And that's not condemnation. It's just calling us higher. Because if people could see Jesus for who he really is, he, most of them would not reject him if you were stupid enough to go to hell anyhow. But most people, if they saw, most of the reason the body of Christ has not captured the world, instead of Islam being the fastest growing religion, is because Christians haven't walked in the love of God the way we were told to. Now, that, and you say, well, this sounds like condemnation. It's not condemnation. It's just that if we find out how to do this, it's doable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're here to find out how to walk in greater love tomorrow. For you to love, walk tomorrow knowing you are loved and love never fails and to explore levels of love you never knew existed. I had a conversation with my mom this week, and she was, they have a new lady at her table. Actually, she's in a rehab right now, but back at the assisted living where she usually lives, she says, she is from a denominational church, and she served God her whole life, and she has no joy, and she never speaks highly of anyone, and she's so not full of love. And I said, Mom, this is what I think. I think we forget where we were when we got filled with the Holy Spirit. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you get filled with love. And you say, well, those are two different things, not according to the Word of God. The Word of God says God is love. And it doesn't say it once or twice. It says a number of times in First John, God is love. Amen. When you get filled with Him, you get filled with more love. And the truth is, there were levels of love that I saw people walking on when I came into Spirit-filled circles. It had never crossed my mind to walk on that level of love. Father Mark Hankins lives at a level of generosity. It never crossed my mind to live on that level of generosity. It just didn't occur to me that it was possible for human beings to love that much. And we're here tonight not just to get more head knowledge, but to find out about levels of love we didn't know existed. Now, if there's one thing I wish 
every pastor in the United States knew is that in the kingdom of God, he who loves most wins. Yeah. And you said, well, pastors know that. Some pastors know that. But not too many. Uh, you see, if every pastor in the United States knew that, and you say, are you criticizing pastors? Absolutely not, because I'm not a perfect pastor. Well, sometimes you hear stories of pastors acting like jerks or pastors hurting people. And you say, well, why would they do that? Because they don't know that he who loves most wins. Yeah. And you see, is that Bible? Absolutely, it's Bible. Right. The Lord just said that the Christianity is really simple. And you say, well, I'm having trouble loving my spouse. We'll focus on that then. Uh -huh. God wants you to love your spouse more than anybody but Jesus. Amen. And you know what? Sometimes it takes a decision. Yeah. I was going to get to this later, but I'll just tell it to you now. Right. Years ago, I was really struggling over whether I had actually forgiven people that had done me wrong. And I mean, what, had they actually done us wrong in the ministry? Yeah, they actually had. And my question was, well, did I really love them? Because I wanted to really love them. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, really loving people is not about warm fuzzies. Really loving people is being able to get down on your face before God and believe in God for his absolute best for those people. Come on. If you can say with everything in me, I right. will be absolute yeah. best of God for you. You love them. You see, love is not a feeling. This whole society is crazy. If your heart's beating faster, you love them. It might be just a heart palpitation. You know what I mean? I mean, if you're hyperventilating, you love them. Well, it might be who knows what, but love is a decision that I want God's very best for you. Even if it means you getting the promotion I was hoping for, I can say before God, I want God's best for you. Because some people sitting here will say, well, I just can't love. Sure, you can love. Love is a decision. Love is an honor before God. When you say you have honored me so far beyond anything I deserve to be honored, I will honor you by loving my neighbor as myself. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to realize that the competitions are over. Nobody has anything to prove except to demonstrate the love that every human being is looking for. Demonstrate that that love is found in Jesus Christ. And you say, well, they can't see his face. No, but they can see yours tomorrow. When you start loving people for no reason, you see, you can't do that. Have you ever read Romans 5? It says the love of God, his love has been poured out within our hearts. Now, we can choose to operate it or not operate in it, but it has been poured out within our hearts. Romans 5, 5. Hallelujah. The only thing we have left to prove is that Jesus' love is the love that this society is, is trying so desperately to find. So, the Holy Spirit, verse 5 here, says the goal of our instruction is love. In the kingdom of God, love is the bottom line. He who loves the most wins. Because love actually never fails. Yeah. Now, I don't know how, a ton of people that believe love never, 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 ever, ever can fail. But if you go down in God's history book as a success, it's going to be because you walked in love. Come on. And if you went down as a failure, it's because you walked selfish. Ooh. And you said, we shouldn't talk like this. This is the time to talk like this, before final exams, okay? <laughs> love, it isn't that love theoretically wins. Here's what I think most Christians believe. Yes, theoretically, love never fails. I'm not into theoretically. No. I don't live in theoretically. I live in the rotten here and now, right here, right now, in this time, in this earth. And I'm telling you, in this earth... Love never fails. And you say, well, my husband doesn't love me. You love him. Mm. You say, well, if I love him, he'll take more advantage of me. No, if you love him, sooner or later, God will step into the situation and he will be your defender in such a way that everybody knows he's defended you. Yeah. You're not getting too many events, but I appreciate the ones in there because it's true. The Bible doesn't say that theoretically love never fails. It says literally in actuality in this life love doesn't fail. Right, yeah. God calls us to walk on a level of kindness that is mind-boggling. He treats you with more respect than you have ever treated him. And he would like you to treat people with more respect than you've ever treated them. And you say, oh, you're being me. No, I'm talking to me too. I, I try to treat the people I live with with a great deal of respect. I respect Nathan and Christiana. Amen. I respect what they do for and you say, why are you using them? Because that's the West for the rubber meets the road. Right, yeah. Everybody can come to church, smile, <laughs> and look so holy. Oh, you guys are you're perfect. Look at them. They're perfect. 
We all know we're perfect until we can be home behind closed doors. That's when the rubber meets the road. I tried to treat Nathan and Christiana with great respect because they do an enormous amount for the church. They do an enormous amount for me. They live what they say they believe. And I'm telling you, you can have heaven on earth in your home. Yeah. And there were a couple of times growing up where there was strife. And this was after they were old enough to get their own places. And I said, I love you having you live here, but I want to tell you one rule. There is no strife in this house. And they thought, <coughs> and I said, no, there's no strife in this house. And they were just joking. I don't care if you're just joking. Oh, just, just play acting fight. There is no strife in this house. Well, and you say, you can't do that. Well, let me ask you something. Would you allow barbiturates and opioids in your house? I personally would not. Over my dead body are they bringing drugs and kill people and enslave people into my house. And if I can draw that line over something in the natural, I can draw that line over something in the spiritual. And it is time that the body of Christ decides there's no strife and fighting in this church. Amen. I wouldn't allow you to bring drugs here and get the kids on them. I wouldn't allow you to destroy them through strife. You see what I'm saying? The reason that love not only theoretically never fails, in actuality literally never fails, is because love himself sits on the throne of the universe, and he decides the final cause about everything. If you walk in love, love himself will defend you. Read Titus 3, 4 to 6, and I realize we probably read these scriptures, but let's just try to read them with fresh eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Titus 3. Verses 4 to 6. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And if you go to verse 5, it says, We were not saved because we were good. How many of you are pretty sure that's right? We were not saved. But we were saved because God is kind. And that kindness, as we behold it, is so powerful, it will transform us into his image. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his image from glory to glory. If you look at his kindness, and you look at the level of respect it never ceases to amaze me how kind the Holy Spirit is. You're, he's far more respectful to you than you are to him. That's nuts. He's the king. Yeah. We're the plebes. We're the peons. Yep. By naturally, and on his side, we don't treat us as peons. He doesn't call us peons, but I was born a peon. I was worse than that. I was a sinner. Selfish, demonic, centered wretch. And he treated me with so much kindness. He let us get born again. And then you walk in his presence. And you find out he never fails because love never fails. Hallelujah. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. What happens if you start treating your co-workers like you love them? You don't have to be weird about it. You don't have to be gushy. You just want the best for them. Right. I went to a pastor's meeting the other day. I don't go to pastor's meetings. Pastors, it's, it's just weird how competition. Uh -huh. It was the sweetest pastor's meeting I've ever been. Oh, okay? And as I'm going there, I'm praying. I say, God, don't let me discourage anybody. Because I watched my husband come away discouraged from pastor's meeting more than any place in the world. Because we were still, we were in a storefront church 17 years. Yeah. The other guys in other buildings and whatever. Well, you know, it took a little longer here, but we made it. And I want to tell you, he was a success because he didn't quit. We're here. Yeah. But I'm not, anyhow, leaving at the end of the meeting, we just had prayer for each other. One young new pastor in town said, I'm so encouraged. And I said, thank you. Because all I wanted was to not discourage somebody. I was believing God that I could keep discouragement. There wasn't any discouragement in that meeting. But you don't know, unless you've been in the ministry, what a supernatural thing that is. Because nobody, everybody, we, they're doing something for God, and you just got to prove you're doing something for God. And, not God you. and nobody's proven anything. If the body of Christ could live there, we would see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We would see yeah. God. Yeah. Because God loves unity. God loves love. Hallelujah. When God the Father poured out the Holy Spirit on us richly, as it says here in verse 6, that means he poured love out on us richly. Because there is only one word that defines the Lord, and that is 
love, perfect, uncompromised love. The truth is, the Bible says that when we let kindness show to the world around us, we have the best shot at winning them to the Lord. We adorn his message. Isn't that interesting? The only time the word adorn is used in the, well, it is used about natural necklaces and stuff in the Old Testament. The only place it's used in the New Testament is that we can adorn the gospel. Let's look at Titus 2, 9 to 10. It says, urge bond slaves. Okay, so that means employees now. Urge employees to be subject to their bosses and everything. To be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. You, know, you don't steal from the company. But showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Your wife can beautify the message. Mom, isn't that wonderful, though, to think our life is capable of making the message of Jesus Christ palatable and attractive? I'd like to read this in the Passion Translation. Servants are to be supportive of their masters and do what is pleasing in every way. They are not to be argumentative nor steal, but prove themselves to be completely loyal and trustworthy. By doing this, they will advertise through all that they do the beautiful teachings of God our Savior. The truth is that if you could see Jesus in his glory and walk with him, it wouldn't be hard to serve him, would it? The more you see him, the more you love him, and the easier it is. The more people can see Jesus Christ in us. And you know, I think sometimes we're worried that people will take advantage of us. But the truth is, walking in love does not mean letting people walk on top of you. No. It just means that if you have to stand up to them in a business deal, you do it with great respect and confidence. Yes. You know? And the truth is, I found that people don't mind you stuff. You stand enough to them as long as you aren't calling them a dirty dog or acting like they're an imbecile. Just do it with respect and kindness. The Amplified here is really nice too. It's in the Amplified translation. Everybody say, My life can adorn the gospel. My life can adorn the gospel. In the Amplified translation, it, it uses the word adorn, but it says it a little bit different. Are we uh, frozen up? I know it does that sometimes. We'll uh, come back to it when it unfreezes. Our life will either misrepresent the Lord Jesus Christ because of selfish motives. I mean, haven't you ever done that? You've seen Christians act it out in a way that it just hurts you because everybody has heard their testimony and now they're acting like a complete jerk. Uh, and so what does the world think? The world thinks that either the Lord is a religious snob or a complete jerk. Okay. I'm, I don't think any of us are doing that, but isn't this good just to stop and think? I just want to be more proactive about showing Jesus. The Amplified says bond servants be to, should be submissive to their masters, pleasing and giving satisfaction in every way. Warn them not to talk back or contradict. Hey, everybody got that? Okay, that's for your boss. Be respectful of the boss. Nor to steal by ta taking things of small value, but prove themselves truly loyal and entirely reliable and faithful throughout, so that in everything they may be an ornament and do credit to the teaching which is from and about God our Savior. So I, I like those translations. You realize this is not condemnation. This, no. is, this is just an inspiration to do a little bit better of showing the real Jesus. Yeah. Anytime you want to know who the mature Christian is, know that it's the degree to which they are convinced of the power of kindness, the power of patience, the power of goodness, the power of gentleness. I know a lot of Christians that don't believe in the power of gentleness. Dad Hagen says sometimes he'd be gentle in a situation and other pastors act like he's stupid. He said, I wasn't stupid, I was just believing in the power of gentleness. Right. Hallelujah, the power, is the power of self-control. What is the goal of the New Testament according to what Paul wrote Timothy? The goal of the New Testament is of love. What is the goal of our studying the Word tonight? And so that tomorrow we'll understand better how much he loves us and how much we're to love everybody else. It's time for just a couple more scriptures. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I love the word of God because when even the people you love and respect on Capitol Hill are mad at each other, <laughs> the people you voted into office and they're all mad at each other, and you think, what is the use, right? 
then you come back to the Word of God and you say, oh yeah, there is such a thing as love, thank God. Okay, Paul writes to the Corinthian church in Corinthians 11, 1. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I may present you a pure virgin. Now you hear two voices here. First of all, on the surface in verse 2, you hear Paul speaking to the Corinthian church that he birthed and brought into relationship with Jesus. And he said, I'm jealous for you. I betrothed you to one husband. But more than that, if you'll listen to the voice behind the voice, you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit says to you, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you a pure virgin. Now, why is the Holy Spirit jealous of our affections? It is the Holy Spirit's job to present us to the Lord Jesus Christ with a pure, uncompromised love and devotion. He's to be our number one, highest of the highest, and best of the best. I mean, there just isn't even a number two. Amen. Years ago, the Lord spoke to me. He said, if I'm number one, who's number two? And I just come back to God, you know, I've never been in the place you're working your way back to God. You did one mess, I don't want to get this right. I was cleaning the house. I can tell you where I was. If God ever speaks to you, as long as you live, you know where you were when it happened. God spoke to me. If I'm number one, who's number two? And I'm backing in me, so he's number one. I thought of Gabriel, and I thought of Michael, and I thought of John the Beloved. And I thought of a whole lot of people. And finally, I heard God laugh. The only time in my life I heard God laugh. And I heard God laugh, and he said, question. Don't you remember I am and there is no one? That's what it says when I say I am and there is no one. Now that doesn't mean you don't have people in your life you love. You do have people in your life you love. But remember what Jesus said, if you don't come to me and hate your mother and your father and your son and your daughter, what does it mean? It means that he is so far above that it's even hard to compare your love right. to everybody else with him. Come on. He's the highest of the highest, the best of the best. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Now look what it says. Verse 3, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your minds would be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Now what is the simplicity and purity that Paul speaks of? There is nothing complicated about the New Testament. <laughs> All right? You got two things to remember. You love God way more than anybody else. And you love everybody else as much as you love you. That's pretty simple. You, got, you love God more than anybody, and you love him passionately, and you love the other guy every bit as much as you love you. We have Fox News on a lot in our house, and when you have the same channel on a lot, you hear the same commercials. We hear the Snitcher System commercial all the time. And it says, it ain't that hard. You eat the food and you lose the weight. You ever heard that one? All right. Well, that was what kept coming to me as I'm reading. You know, it ain't that hard. You love God with everything in you. You love the other guy as much as you, and you watch God make you a success. Yeah. And you say, that's not true, Pastor. It is true. Yes, it, is. it is true. They, I don't care how much people hate women in ministry. Mm -hmm. If God calls you, and you'll be respectful and walk in love, uh -huh. that's the end of the deal. So and you say, why? You see, people come in here, other pastors come in here, and say, wow, this place is a success. You must have men trying to take the place over all the time. You know, because that's what people do. They try to take churches over. <laughs> I thought, you don't know one thing. You don't know I'm a friend of God. Amen. You say, you're arrogant. I'm not arrogant. I'm not arrogant. I don't know everything about everything. You try to get me on eschatology, I have almost given up studying eschatology. Because even the big wigs can't agree. Okay, they may have charts and charts and charts of when Jesus is coming back. Do you know how many have been wrong? All of them so far. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. If there is a secret yeah. that is so simple. People don't believe it. And that is if you'll walk in love toward God and toward man. Right. You're invincible until the day Jesus comes for you. Hallelujah. Some people think I can't love other people like that. Nobody could. Because people can be jerks. I know... Has anybody else ever forgot? Sometimes people can be total blankety blank blankety blank jerks. Total jerks. I'm gonna say the blankety blank. You know what I'm saying? People can be amazing jerks. 
So you say, I can't love them. Yes, you can. Yeah. You may not get warm, fuzzy wuzzies. <laughs> But God doesn't ask you to get warm, fuzzy, fuzzy. He asks you to lift them up before him in prayer and say, Lord, I forgive this person. And for the sake of their soul, I'm asking you to forgive them. Do you remember what Stephen said when his brains were falling out? He was getting stoned to death. And he said, Lord, hold not this sin to their account. And you know what? In that moment, God forgave Saul of Tarsus who was watching their clothes. And Saul was able to get saved because he released them. When you pray for somebody, this is not just a formality. You are lifting them up and saying, for the sake of their soul, I ask you not to hold what they did against me against them. I want them saved. I love them. I want your best for them. And then the, form, the warm fuzzy onesies don't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're feeling it yet. Because I want to tell you something. If you will live there and pray for your worst enemies for the very best, It'll come from like you don't hate them anymore. You might feel sorry for them, but you don't hate them because you understand how broken they are. Dad, my dad. You're not John. I'd also like to say to people who think, well, somebody walks in love, poor them. They never have any happy days. I never had any happy days until I started walking in love. Amen. Praying for your enemies does at least as much good for you as it does for them. Probably more. Amen. Praying for your enemies causes you to find favor in the sight of God. It is what Jesus did on the cross. It is what Stephen did as the stones flew. When you're like Jesus, you get a lot of favor. Yeah. Does everybody understand? If you got his favor, you're good to go. It doesn't matter if there's 150 million billion people against you. If you got his favor, you're good to go. Yeah. You pray for your enemies, you have his favor. The key to loving people is that they are joyful, peaceful, happy people. Praying for your enemies melts your hard defiant heart in the moldable clay. If you're mad at your spouse, start praying 20 minutes for them. Start thanking God for all their wonderful points and all the times they put up with you when somebody else might not have. And you might not have put up with them if you'd wrecked the car. Okay, just thank God and pray for them. If you will, it will melt your heart that has gotten hard toward them. The key to loving people is that loving people are joyful, peaceful, and happy. Angry people are triggered quick tempers, and that is not a recipe for joy and kindness. People who get mad at the drop of a hat are not joyful people, they're miserable people. Under, and you say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about believing in the love of God. It says in 1 John 4 that perfect love casts out fear. If you really believed what Jesus said, it said more than once in the Bible, Jesus said, I've loved you the way the Father loved me. That's crazy. And then in, 17, in John 17, he said, oh, Father, you've loved them as much as you love me. That means that the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Jesus loves you as much as he loves the Father. If you ever believe that, you'll be a nicer person. Yeah. You know why? Because all the fear goes. What am I going to be afraid of if Jesus loves me that much? There's nothing to be afraid of socially, financially, no thing, nothing. If you will begin to pray that the Lord will change you to love people more, and we all need this, and then pray and boost your faith in the Word. The way you say, well, I just don't have faith to walk in love. Okay. Pick this Bible up and read about Joseph, of how he treated his brothers and yeah. who, who came out on top. Read and get faith for it. Understand, I've got one minute, this better go fast. <laughs> Understand that believing in love does not mean you walk, let people walk all over you. It means that you stand up to them with respect and dignity and kindness. Okay? You know, you may have to call Verizon and say, look, this bill just isn't right. But you don't yell at them or personally attack somebody who had nothing to do with your bill. You're kind, okay? Yeah. Now, the other thing, and i got to quit because it's 8 o'clock, but it says love has been very misunderstood and misrepresented. For example, some people think if you love your children, you just let them go. And that's not what the Bible says. If you love your children, you'll correct them. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says that the Lord rebukes you. And there's something really beautiful I'd like to share with you. I've never um, this is Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, that if you love your children, you're going to correct them, and the Lord corrects you. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord, or both his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves. 
When was the last time you realized God was calling you to do something better? Come on. Anybody? If not, I need to pray for you right away. I mean, really soon, okay? How he's, a, he's in the business. But do you know why he's in the business of calling us higher? Because he loves us. And this is the deal. I never saw this progression. I know you know these scriptures, but look at Revelation 3. I just love this. I've never seen it before. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I would spit you out of the mouth. Okay, pause. All extremists know these scriptures, right? Uh, All right? No. He is rebuking them for being lukewarm. But now watch. If, if, if you go to the couple verses down, after they repent, it says, Those of my love, I reprove and discipline. That's what he's doing. He said, you make me want to vomit. That's a pretty hard review. You know, if the Lord looks at me and says, you make me sick. Ouch. Yeah, yeah. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, what happens when you repent? Very next verse. After you repent, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If it higher levels of communion. Uh, yeah. I stand at the door and knock. Open the door, I will come in. He is calling you higher so that he can live closer with you. And when you look closer, you say, oh, I get more communion. Let's look at what happens in the next verse. Verse 21. I never saw the progression here. He who overcomes. There is an overcoming factor that comes from the presence of Jesus Christ. I don't know how it works. I only know that the days that I really get into his presence is like grease lightning. Easy. And the days that I don't is like this downward spiral. I give all experience. When he reproves you and says, I want you to walk in more love. I want you to be kinder to your husband and kinder to the clerk at the store. I want you to show proactively the love of Jesus. He's not doing that to do anything but bless your life. So that when you repent and you come up higher in your walk of love, he says, I'd like to come closer. Is there anybody besides me that would like to live closer to Jesus? I would like to live closer to Jesus. I really would. Then he says, okay, let's have some communion. And you know what the result of that communion is? Victory, victory, overcoming, victory, victory. Isn't that true? Isn't that what you just thought? Isn't that cool? Oh, I think that's cool. God bless you. Who's going to lead us? Everybody's out. Know you all this.